I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of Retention as a Service Agency, Electric. Uh, and today I'm talking with Brendan Tobin, the founder of Odd Duck, which is a fractional growth marketing group and full service performance marketing agency. Uh, thanks for coming on. Happy to have you. Dude, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So before we jump into things, can you give everybody just a quick background uh, on yourself? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, you said it well, uh, founder of Odd Duck. Uh, full service performance marketing agency and fractional growth marketing group. Uh, my background is in uh, growth marketing, have spent the past few years doing that, working with brands like Jet.com, Verb Energy, uh, BCG Digital Ventures before launching my own thing and working with some awesome brands like Josie Marin, Hippo Education, Rivet, um, some really cool brands. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I have focused on acquisition, but have touched all things from CRO to retention um, and just building out a team that absolutely crushes across all those different verticals. That's awesome. Um, and what, like, what is your background up until, you know, starting Odd Duck? Yeah, so it, it has been performance marketing. So that's kind of, I focused on acquisition for growth. Um, so that's been it with probably a fo uh, greatest focus on paid social, but I've also touched a lot of paid search um, and CRO and retention. But uh, a lot of my retention has actually come from you, I feel like, the videos <laughs> you would put out with Electric. And so um, I learned from the absolute best on that regard. Well, I'm, I'm flattered. I'll, I'll take it. Some, some affirmation on a Friday heading into the weekend. The, uh... <laughs> Dude, start the Friday off, right? <laughs> um, well, like going from you know, working at a pretty sizable company to sort of shooting off and, and starting your own thing. What are some of the, and yeah, obviously you're still early on for you, but what are some of the things that, uh, you know, you didn't necessarily expect that you've run into, um, along the way? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's a bunch, I think, so, so I've been kind of fortunate enough where I've had both the brand experience and the, the agency side experience. So, I felt like there's a lot of different things that I've been able to touch, which has helped me a lot. But some of the things that I, I maybe didn't expect, I think going into it, I just, I think how important those client touch points are has been, has been a, a huge thing. Sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're on growth, right, you having seen so many companies were like, this is what's absolutely best for the company. This is what we need to be working on right now. Um, and obviously, you know, it's, you know, our duty to make sure we effectively communicate that and share that. But sometimes teams are still like, yes, we hear you, but at the same time, we think this is what's best. And at the end of the day, it's their brand. And so, um, you know, kind of balancing that, hey, this is what we know has worked. This is what we've seen has worked with, you know, clients telling you, we hear you, let's definitely put it on the roadmap, but we view priorities as different. Um, just kind of making sure that we balance that to uh, ensure the best possible growth has been definitely a, a new learning experience for me. So. Um, that's been been super fun to to learn how to handle. Yeah, uh, you know, managing clients, I feel like is is half the battle. Um, yeah, especially when you're coming from the outside, there's sort of an art to, you know, getting your point across and getting things done, but not stepping on any toes either. Dude, yeah, especially on the because because I'm on the like actual fractional growth side of things where it's, hey, we, we work directly with you. You know, we're not an agency in the traditional sense where we're just doing media buying and, you know, possibly just sharing, you know, creative recommendations. And then we meet once a week and it, we're on our way and we'll see you next week. Um, maybe you'll get an email with reporting. Uh, we, like, that's not what we do. So, you know, there's a lot more balancing with that. But uh, curious to, to learn at some point too about what that looked like at Electric because, I feel like you guys are building out so much with the, on the retention side of things that um, there's got to be, especially with creative stuff, people just saying, hey, like this is you know not exactly what we're looking for at this very moment. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the biggest thing uh, with Electric when dealing with clients and, and managing expectations is just that like first week of onboarding 
it's probably was probably the most crucial with any of our relationships and setting up for setting it up for success because if you have like a bad first week Definitely. it's it's very challenging to try and you know course correct but if you set it off yeah. in a good direction to start and everybody's aligned around you know objectives and goals and how we're going to accomplish them um those are by far our, our better relationships yeah that's the nice thing about I, I feel like traditional agencies the scope is so fleshed out uh where it's like from the start it's like the role is so well defined whereas on fractional growth it's like every company is going to look different and everything's going to be you know not as like what was turnkey for someone else isn't gonna be the same thing you experience for the next brand and so um yeah there's probably it's a lot easier to find scope i feel like but uh cool man that's great are you and when you're typically doing engagements um have you thought about what sort of uh, pricing framework that you want to you know deploy is it because i i mean was making shit up for the longest time like oh yeah this sounds good like whatever um you, i try to i try to like do it you know based off of hours and i try to do it based off of you know roi and at the end of the day it was sort of like you know how much do i think i can get this person to pay for what we're going to provide to them um which yeah. is the reality <laughs> It's tough. Um, I feel like I've gone through a few learning cycles with it where it's actually funny enough. I just cut two clients pretty much because I was like, the pricing doesn't make sense. They were like, Hey, we want to do this on hours, but you know, they were pretty early on and, uh, they were saying, you know, we can pay you this much and just give us four hours of your time a week. But it was kind of like, Hey, for, for what I envision for you, this is not enough time. Um, like that's like the actual amount of work that's going to have to go into this to accomplish the things that I view are the best things for your business. I just can't set out to do in, in four hours a week. Um, and I was like, this just doesn't work as an arrangement. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely want to move away from some of the time stuff. That's where, where I've been, where I've grown up my clients doing that on a time basis. I think what's tough is like, you're right. There's different values, right? We just did a, an incrementality test for a brand. And we were like, hey, we just found, you know, a third of your budget is, you know, not incremental. We're going to repurpose this and put this in a different spot. And it's going to help you grow, you know, probably close to, you know, I think we put an estimate at like 42, 45 percent year over year uh, just from this, you know, reallocated spend. And so it was kind of like, well, we just paid for ourselves, uh, you know, many times over. Uh, so, you know, and, and that's, you know, first two months in that we've done this. So. I think I'm still trying to figure that out a little bit where it's like, how do we define the value, especially because so many different brands are, are different, right? Like I, I had a referral the other day where someone came in and was like, can you do this for this much money? And I was like, I just don't think so. And I just cut a brand that did another thing. But, you know, even for a brand where I was like, okay, sweet, I view this as worth my time. I, I go and see like the amount of output that we give them in such a short amount of time. It's like, shoot, man, maybe I, I'm, I'm not charging enough, but, um, yeah, I'm still figuring that out. I think it's got to be on scope. I think every every company is going to be so different, right? Like, I think larger clients are going to have a lot more opportunity where it's like, you know, you can come in and, and change some things. And it's, it's pretty, pretty massive ROIs because they are just playing with such massive numbers. Um, and the value to them is, is so much greater than, hey, you go in with a smaller brand. They're, they're pretty net new. You know, maybe you grow some stuff. But at the same time, it's like their numbers that they're playing with are just so much smaller. Um, so I'm just kind of figuring it out, uh, right? I'd love to work with every brand that I honestly find value in that I think is like, hey, I like the people or I, I like the vision, but yeah, still trying to to figure out how to do that. Um, yeah, and it's been tough too, because it, it, it was at a point where I was like, oh man, look at this. This, this thing is growing like crazy. We're doing such awesome work. But I was like, I am not, my like per hour rate is probably not where it should be. So um, trying to figure it out, trying to get to a place where it's scalable and it's defined on scope. So we'll see. But I'm sure with the, you know, conversations like you, I'll, I'll learn how to do it better and better and, and get some of those learnings. I think the, uh, the, the most interesting part of it, um, and there, there's some movie, I, I think it maybe is like war dogs or something, but they like, they bid on a contract and they bid way too low. And yeah. Um, that happened. Yeah, Jonah Hill's in the 
<laughs> hallway screaming and like pounding the lockers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, I've, I've definitely had that feeling before because like, you know, if it takes them an hour to say yes, you're like, oh, well, I mean, I probably could have gotten a couple extra thousand dollars out of that engagement. Yeah. And so that, yeah. that was a no, learning I, process. For I sure. had it happen on a, I definitely had it happen on a phone call where I, where, you know, I was talking to someone with said the pitch and, you know, I give this rate and I'm, I'm thinking, oh man, this will be, you know, the highest rate possible. Uh, and they're like, they're like, yeah, let me give you a call back. Like, let me just talk with finance. I got a call 10 minutes later. They're like, <laughs> done. And I was just, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> uh, but I was so happy. I was just so happy to have landed it. And I was like, this is going to be great. I, I was still so excited. Um, so I didn't have my Jonah Hill in the, the hallway moment. I was probably more Miles Teller in that moment. But um, yeah, I was pretty happy with it. Yeah, the uh, the process of like, being comfortable with saying some of those numbers took a little bit as well yeah. too. Uh, cause it feels like you know, pretty extreme, especially for me. Like when I was in college, I'd be like, Oh yeah, you know, you're going to pay me X amount per month. Um, it was just sort of a crazy, you know, swing cause it went from pretty much nothing to like a lot very quickly and being comfortable yeah. with that. And also being able to like, you know, present and, have the confidence to say, Oh yeah, like I'm actually worth this amount and was, was a challenge. But on the flip side, I had some clients that said no early on because we were too cheap. Yeah. So like they're getting quotes for, you know, wild amounts of money for like Shopify migrations or, uh, you know, whatever it may be. And we're coming in, you know, 20, 30% lower, lower uh, than, than the the next lowest competitor and so in their eyes they're like well what's wrong with you know this company or are we getting like the yeah. the cheap shitty service so we had to start adding in like additional profit margin for no reason other than like <laughs> had to get the clients comfortable of being able to work with us which is ridiculous but uh you know it worked out in our favor obviously it was like the, the Peloton story. I don't know if you've heard this, but I, I'm pretty sure with Peloton, kind of early on, they like priced the bike with like, it was probably still way too overpriced for what it was, but they like priced the bike that I think was more in line with kind of the market. And then I don't know, I don't know what the catalyst of it was, but they ended up just pricing it way up. And it just went gangbusters. Like it, they were like, whoa, this is like this crazy new product and innovation. Um, and it's, you know, basically a bike with an iPad on it. Um, I do have one though, so I, I can't even talk, uh, negatively about it, but at the same time, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it worked on like you. Once they changed the price. Yeah. It, once they changed the price, they were like, this is Peloton. This is no longer, you know, the bike with the iPad. This is its own thing. So, um, I'm curious if you do, you, cause the thing that I've, I'm so interested in right now with agencies is, do you put your pricing on your website? Uh, and I'm pretty sure electric does it right. Uh, because the thing is the, how do you price it again, where it's, you, you know, you get a client where, you know, they're not price sensitive and they said, we just need somebody who has a killer work product, uh, versus, you know, a company that, you know, maybe like I mentioned earlier is a bit earlier and they're like, Hey, we just need someone who can do this cheaply. Like pricing matters. So. How, how have you kind of structured pricing up front with clients? Have, is there anything you saw with, hey, certain size clients, we're going to pitch them at this, or, you know, we're going to start here and, and, and see where that goes? Um, how have you kind of navigated that? Yeah. So like your question is in terms of pricing, how we navigated that? Yeah. Like, have you been up front with it? Have you been, uh, like, how, how much do you say? Because if you, you know, you're like, hey, we do you know, I'll use arbitrary numbers. If it's like, Hey, we do 10 K for, you know, monthly. Um, but then you get a, you know, a massive company that comes along and they're like, everybody else is at 50. Uh, yeah. like, yeah, like done. How do you, how do you avoid your, uh, Jonah Hill in the hallway moment? Um, luck, like <laughs> you, you, because sometimes we would overbid too. So it's like, I, it's not a science. It's sort of just like feeling out, the um you're just sort of feeling out the client and you do some you know yeah. background research around who they are uh you know if they are if they're a client who is 
like a public company, for example, or things like that, there's, there's clear indicators or, or signs of, you know, where we should be from a price standpoint. Um, and then one of the things that I like to do is sort of provide, you know, three plans. So of your good, better, best style uh, proposal structure. And so you can yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. you can anchor them into the one that you actually want them to choose based off of the way that you price uh, or have, you know, cost efficiencies when you make it to the, to the final plan. Um, nice. but it's not like there's some science to it. I actually, I've, oh, yeah. and I've tried in the past to just get them to tell me like what the budget is. Cause that would actually be so much easier. They're like, yeah, we have 10 grand a month for you. Okay. Well, let me now like come back to the team and divvy up how we're going to allocate that 10 grand versus I'm just making shit up over here, $10,000. And then let's put some deliverables against it. It would make things a lot simpler yeah. if they're like, you know, we have $10,000 a month for you. And then I can go back and, you know, tinker and provide deliverables that are going to be able to, you know, showcase an ROI for them. Uh, but there's this idea from a lot of the clients that, you know, if we tell you what the budget is, then you're just going to take all of it, uh, which I can see that side of things as well too. But for me, I always yeah. preferred when clients would work with us on like the good or better plan, not the best, because I'd rather work with somebody for a year at a lower per month cost than like work with somebody for six months at a higher per month cost. And uh, especially with retention and like email and SMS marketing, it's not like you just flip a switch and within a week, you know, all of these magical things happen. So I'd much prefer you know, let's have a less like a, a, a reduced engagement that allows us to work together longer versus, you know, let's throw the kitchen sink at it and then have a bunch of swings and, you know, not a lot of client, uh, you know, not sustainability, but like client security. So I prefer yeah. the lower engagements, which might sound counterintuitive, but you... I don't want to price them out of being able to work with us. Definitely. Do you pack that up the price or is it like, do you think that like, Hey, if you're doing that best engagement, there's like a certain level of uh, scrutiny that the client's going to have for you. If it's like, Hey, something goes wrong. It's like, this is the best of the best. And this is what you have. Uh, like, wh whereas like, if you're on that, like good or better plan, maybe they're like, yeah, this is, this is it. Like how much do you think is price sensitivity versus just expectations of quality? Yeah, obviously I, electric has you know the highest quality of work, but obviously you know top tier number one, number one in the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's expectations that come with it for sure, and and we didn't have, and, and a lot of it doesn't even have to do with the actual work product. A lot of it has to do with the way that you mm -hmm. like engage with the client, uh, do meetings, like you know presentation materials. Uh, stuff like that. And we didn't have that to begin with. And so we would yeah. start an engagement. And there's just a level of expectation like, oh, like we should have an account manager. This is the way that we're used to working with other agencies. And you don't have it, yet we're still paying you, you know, like the same amount. So we had to adjust and transition into, you know, sort of up leveling, not our work product, but our like, intra client facing materials, you know, the way that we handled meetings, proposals, things like that. Um, I feel like that's where more of the expectations were not necessarily like, you know, the results because the results were there. It was more about the way that we engage with the client on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. What does the report, like do yeah, the okay. reports look nice? It might sound stupid, but like, you know, no, it matters. It matters. And, uh, like <laughs> I look at some of our early proposals or some of our early, uh, reporting decks and I'm just like, I can't even believe that anybody worked with us. Like this shit is just objectively not good. Yep. And then looking at it now, it looks, you know, light years better. And especially when we got, um, when we got acquired by drinks, they have a team of, you know, very senior creatives. And so they, you know, took our proposals and audits and whatnot and, took it to an even greater level that we would not have been able to do because they had been, you know, making materials for fortune 500 companies for the last like 10 years. And 
I know from your background and at least from my, you know, my other friends who work in that world, you know, you guys love your slide decks. So <laughs> nuts, dude. Nuts. <laughs> um, yeah, I was literally going to say, uh, this is the thing, you know, it's so funny. I, I, when I went to BCG digital ventures, uh, which very different from traditional consulting, right? Like we actually like went and built and did like hand on execution and reporting and all these things. We, we, we basically were an agency before, you know, larger clients or did venture builds where we built from scratch for larger clients. And, and one of the things that I learned, I feel like going into it, I was like, I kind of already had what I felt like were my marketing and strategy chops, like so much. So I, I, I kind of launched that. I don't know if you remember, but launched an ed tech like business for a little while that got to like 200 users and one B2B partnership. Uh, before realizing no money in education. But when I was at BCG, I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping to learn a lot more of these like marketing skills and, you know, see as much as I can because that was my goal. I just wanted to grow as many businesses as possible and probably like the most valuable skill that I learned because, you know, I did already have a lot of these marketing and strategy jobs and, and you know, obviously continue to grow a lot. But the most valuable skill really was like how you presented things. Like it didn't just matter like what you said, but how it looked like really did matter. And like how you spoke about it really did matter. And it's a weird thing to say, but you know, again, it's like this idea of buy-in, like, what does it look like? Um, and I, I, I don't know, even with startups, you can kind of relate to it a lot, right? Like an idea isn't always, um, you know, the most novel thing, but how it's executed is, is really what matters. And I, I think it's probably the same thing, with like how you present things where it's like, hey, look, like I, I can go to a client and, and say like, hey, we, you know, we've, we just took you from, you know, like a, a one row as to like a, 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 a 2.45 you know, on, on new customer acquisition. Um, and, you know, that's before considering that's first purchase. Like, you know, you can say that thing in passing and it's like fantastic. But it's like, you know, you kind of immortalize it when you have, you know, proper reporting. And it's like, hey, look at what we did for you this week. It's in writing. Here's how it looks presented. It's like, it's kind of just that like icing on top of like, wow, like they're, I'm in very good hands. Like someone is taking care of me. Uh, you know, I feel like that's where, yeah, it, it really does matter. Those touch points, you know, just like how you make someone know they're in good hands. It's like, you can do the greatest work in the world, but if you don't show it, it's not as important. Yeah. It's all about framing, you know, presentation. You can put lipstick on a pig, um, for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and like good looking pig. The uh, one of the biggest learning lessons for me was when we started bringing on new team members, even if they knew what they were doing, right. if they weren't able to properly communicate that to the client or present it in a way with like authority, then the client would be like, you know, this person doesn't know what they're talking about even though they could be saying yep. exactly the right Probably. things versus I could get out there and just start lying, like literally saying blatantly false shit. As long as I did it in a way that was confident and made it seem like, you know, I knew what I was talking about. They'd actually prefer yep. that versus the other way, which is, you know, sort of questioning your own, like when you're saying something and you're, you're like sort of posing it as a question, you're not necessarily, uh, asserting yourself as the expert in that particular subject matter, which is ultimately what you're being paid for is to be the expert in that particular domain. Um, yeah. So there's it's like a very unfortunate reality, but like once you do get that duo of, Hey, you have this absolute, you know, killer on the, you know, the digital marketing side and they have strong interpersonal skills and, and you know, that that's also something that could be learned. Uh, I feel like that's where you get you know, just incredible talent because it's, Hey, this person can do this and like they can get that buy-in from you or they can showcase it to you in the way that, you know, really resonates. Yeah. What are you most excited for, uh, you know, going into, uh, going into next year when it comes to next year, honestly, just growth. I feel like what I'm most excited for is, is putting myself out there in a way that's different from, I mean, like, I, I feel like I've done really awesome stuff in kind of the, the different like W2 roles that I've had, you know, like, you know, won this award at BCG, you know, Verb Energy grew crazy during my time there. Uh, and, and, and so I think the most thing I'm, I'm excited for is now that it's kind of like my own is to just kind of showcase, Hey, look at what we did. Right. Like, obviously like, like, 
I think there is never an iron team. Uh, but, you know, I, I think I'm just most excited for, for the team to kind of show, like, hey, look at what, like, we did. Like, this is just, like, solely odd duck, like, came in and, and we, like, working with these teams, like, we were able to, like, find this exponential growth and kind of kind of showcase that to the public, I feel like, where we're doing such awesome stuff right now. Um, and just being able to make that visible and, and be like, hey, like, we're doing things differently. We're shaking things up. Like, take a look. Um I think that's what I'm really excited for, just to kind of like, one, obviously get those results, but two, uh, to the point of like showcasing them, how you put it out there, just being in a position where it's like, look, we're doing things differently and it works. Um, so I think that's what I'm really excited for, especially right now. Um, but yeah, tw- just growth in general too, outside of that, right? I feel like I'm, I'm so early in this, uh, having done, again, have been doing this for years, but you know, doing this officially for myself full time um, and building a team at, I feel like I'm just really excited to grow, put together a team, you know, put together a team that's different than I feel like a lot of agency models and um, have incredible like people benefits and stuff. Um, I feel like I'm just super excited for everything that comes with that, like that growth. Um, obviously, I think there's things that are a bit terrifying about it. I'm sure early on in electric, there was probably a point where you were like, holy shit, like this thing's like going up and up and up. And now there's like a lot of responsibilities. Um but yeah, it's it's a it's an exciting time. Yeah, uh, there was definitely a lot of a lot of those moments for sure. Um, but I think you know once you are further along with it, um, it's very hard to go back. Like I don't think you, at least for me, like I wouldn't be able to go do the the standard nine to five. Um, also, I'd be yeah. I'd be the worst employee ever just terrible <laughs> really that's the spirit dude uh no yeah. dude you can do anything uh but why do you say that um i don't know the problem with authority <laughs> no i think the the uh i guess it depends on the on the business um and the way that it's structured it just feels like at least uh, i actually have never had you know a job post post college, like all, all my stuff was just internships. But for my internships, there was just a bunch of scenarios where they're just doing shit the wrong way, objectively, like could yeah. very, could very easily make, you know, this process way more efficient or, you know, do this thing in a way better fashion than the way that they're currently doing it. But they just don't want to change or they just don't really give a shit what you have to say because, you know, you haven't been there for 15, 20 years or whatever. Um, yeah. And in 20 years, I want to be, you know, sailing around the world on my, on, on my yacht, helping advise a bunch of other startups, not, you know, just having Whoa. like, not just having like <laughs> achieved the, uh, you know, whatever the next like promotion. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of politicking as well too. Like some of my friends who work at very large companies, half of their day is just spent like, you know, how are we navigating our way through this organization? Not necessarily how are we putting forth like our best work product or our best work effort. Um, and you see it all the time. I mean, even with like, I'll use Disney as an example. Like, you know, Bob Iger comes back and he, he shit cans everybody. Like everybody's gone. Um, that's crazy to me. Like not having that level of control of like your own destiny um, is, is, is scary. But yeah, I think. Dude, I'm going to put you in the, the hot seat for <laughs> one second. How do you then create, so like, obviously you now see this like, you know, very unfortunate reality of, uh, you know, the, the working world. How did you, during your time at Electric, make sure that that wasn't the case for the people that were working under you? I mean, for sure. If you asked like, you know, like one or two people, I'm sure they would say exactly what I just said. Like, that's just the reality. Mm-hmm. You can't be, you can't be perfect for you know, for everybody, it's not going to work out for everyone, especially when you start growing um, and have like enough team members. It's not the right fit for for everybody. Um, But I think for me, it was like, I knew the type of, or I know the type of manager that I am, or the way that I would want to be handled if I was a a team member. Um, And it's, it's very much so a not micromanaging, like the exact opposite. And some people actually don't like that. Some people are like, what am I supposed to do? Like, you know, you, you, need, you, need, to, you need to tell yeah. me like from nine to five, do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, no, uh, you know, here's the goal. 
but like you sort of figure out how to get us there. And so a lot of it came down to hiring the right people that would fit into that. Because if I hired somebody who wanted more structure, then they'd probably hate it and be like, oh, you know, Brandon's a terrible manager. He's not good at setting, you know, clear like guidelines for what I should be doing uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so I think a lot of it was that. Um, and not and just like not overcomplicating things, like treating it. I, I wouldn't say treating it like a friendship, but also not treating it. So it's like so corporate and like there, there, there should be some overlap. Like I feel like when we were at our, our, our peak, it was when we were able to, you know, go out to dinner together, like, you know, do team events, like bond outside of just the office and realize that everybody has a personal life and their own goals, both professionally and personally. And like just having open and honest conversations with team members around what they're looking to accomplish. And then the last thing would be taking feedback and like actually doing something with it versus just, you know, a lot of businesses they will be like, oh yeah, you can submit this or that, but like, you, you know, it's not going anywhere. And so we had every yeah. team member submit three things that we're not doing that we should be doing. And then I put together this like massive slide deck with each item that had been submitted and then talk through each one and like how we were addressing them or how we weren't addressing them or how maybe we were addressing it differently or like in, in when we did it very early on, we didn't have like all the benefits yet that you would expect at like a, a larger business. And so talk through, you know, in, in four months, this is when we're onboarding with like this PEO provider, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some of them were ridiculous, like, you know, pay off all my college debt, but most of them were very, uh, very helpful in helping craft like electric and what we were all going to be doing together. Uh, it's not like I was just yeah. sitting there, you know, directing everybody, uh, like, you know, chess pieces on a board. It was much more of a, a group, a group effort. Yeah. Dude, that makes a ton of sense. I also appreciate the, the, the radical candor. I feel like it is hard once it's like, once you get to a size of an organization where there's, there's certain, I mean, you can't always be everything for everybody. Right. I feel like there. So I appreciate the radical candor around that. Um, yeah, it, it, it reminds me of something Mark Lori would say. He was, uh, he found a jet and then, you know, sold it to the <laughs> Walmart. Um, and a bunch of other startups too. He also had a, a startup that he sold to diapers.com, sold it to Amazon. Um, he, he, his like style was, Hey, we're going to hire the right people. Like, you know, he, I think he called it like, I don't remember. Uh, he had an acronym that like was like smart, passionate, optimistic, uh, you know, empathetic stuff like that. And he's like, if I hire the right people, um, and there's literally things that he would look at on a resume and be like, I know that this person was in this role for a long time and, and they did good work. And, um, so I know that they can do good stuff here. Uh, that's a good fit. If he, his, his way of going was I'm going to hire the right people. I'm going to give the direction. And if I've hired the right people, they should be able to craft it themselves, right? Yeah. Like they, they have the autonomy to go and build this because I know that they're the right person for the job. There's no reason to like micromanage this person or, or get them in a, a different spot, but yeah, it's probably a leadership style too, where there is certain people where it's like, I think Steve Jobs was probably like, hey, this is my vision. Uh, it needs to be implemented to a certain T. And to do that, like there's going to be a certain level of micromanaging that happens. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting take, different leadership styles. Um, but cool to hear that you, you took the feedback too of the people that are working there because yeah, uh, maybe someday when you're before you're sailing around the world, man, you'll be you'll be working for someone else, and you'll be like, "Not I treated people right." <laughs> no, uh, fingers crossed. No, but we'll see. <laughs> never say never. All right. Never say never. Never say never. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for coming on. This was fun. Um, before we wrap things up here, can you let everybody know like where they can where they can find you, your business online? Uh, yeah, so, so we're actually finishing up the website right now. So, uh, might be a, a post thing if, if that's okay, <laughs> but, um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Brennan Tobin, happy to connect. Uh, you'll, you know, always happy to have a conversation, provide as much value as I can to anybody. Um, so yeah, feel free to, feel free to reach out and, 
sorry, I don't have the, the link just yet, but uh, by the time this episode drops, I, I definitely will. And you can find it on my personal profile. So thanks again for having me, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. I think, you know, in, in my perspective, working with a, an agency that's just starting, like yours is actually a great time because uh, you still have the A team. Like when you go work with the agency yeah. that has 200, 300, 400 people, like the A team has sold and is gone or they're just like sort of yeah. there and they're the face, but they're not really, you know, in the weeds. And that's actually, that's yeah. how we got like all of our clients is we took, you know, the clients that were not ginormous to some of the larger folks, but were tremendously, you know, impactful for our business and they got our A team. And so like when, whenever, whenever anybody comes to me, who's like, Oh, you know, how do we choose or select an agency? It's like a sweet spot of where, you know, you still have the, the A team in place, but yeah, that's my, yeah. Come by. You'll be, that's my pitch for, me. that's I, my I, pitch for odd duck. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's all, I'm hoping to always keep it A team players. Uh, that's like, yeah, I, I feel like I'd rather teach somebody how to do the presenting and, and teach somebody the interpersonal skills with clients, but just make sure that they're an absolute killer on all things growth. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely come, come work with me and, you know, love to, to connect and if not love to provide value anyway, I can. Yeah, man. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. Yeah. Well, we can do this episode in another year or two and we'll see how some of your answers change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds uh, good. Awesome. Well, uh, as always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com and electricmarketing.com and, uh, we will see you next time.